I'm Brittany Yaldin, a biodiversity and conservation student. I wanted to make this documentary because after working with koalas for six years, I've come to realise that most people don't know a thing about them, and especially what's happening with our wild populations. I went to seek out the truth about koala conservation and spoke to animal activists, politicians and scientists to see what they're doing about the situation. <coughs> to the wombat, Australia is a land full of astonishing unique creatures. It really is a place like no other. Koalas annually bring over one billion dollars worth of revenue to the Australian economy, a number that continues to grow each year. International tourists flood from every corner of the globe just for their chance to meet these adorable teddy bear-like creatures. Despite koalas being such an icon of our national heritage, it seems most of the difficulties they're facing go unnoticed by the public. The koala has been here for an estimated 4 million years. Population numbers were in absolute abundance during the time of white settlement. Soon after, however, they were hunted for their fur and by the 1930s had dramatically declined in number. Finally, due to public protest, hunting was put to an end. Much like it did many years ago, the koala faces the danger of extinction once again. Koalas are under threat due to motor vehicle accidents, domestic dog and cats, climate change, bushfires, and most of all, habitat fragmentation, habitat loss, and disease. The Koala Hospital at Port Macquarie is involved in treating and releasing the sick and injured koalas who have come face to face with these issues. The non-for-profit organisation has approximately 200 to 250 koalas admitted each year. Local and overseas volunteers primarily run the hospital and are responsible for carrying out daily duties including cleaning of the yards, supplying fresh eucalyptus and water, and checking koala health. Shane Flanagan is the supervisor at the Koala Hospital. Assessing newly admitted koalas, applying treatments, doing ultrasounds and taking blood tests are just some of her daily tasks. This last couple of months has just been unbelievable. This is supposed to be a relatively quiet time of year, yeah. and we just inundate. We've got um, about 40 more than we did last year. Many of the koalas require extra care, such as this young female. Ruins Way Dallas fell out of a tree and now receives home care from one of the hospital volunteers. Dallas is slowly regaining her strength, taking a step, or a hop, closer to her release. Gunnata Toby is one of the resident koalas here at the hospital. The indent on his head was caused from an oncoming car. The ultrasound shows he has no internal damage. However, he's not ready to be released back to the wild just yet as he shows symptoms of chlamydia. Shane must now test to see if he has the disease. All we can do now is wait for the results. Much like Gunnata Toby, many wild koalas share the same fate. Chlamydia can lead to eye junctivitis, blindness, infertility and even death. The number one reason koalas come into care at the koala hospital is because of chlamydia. Um, which is a disease that is expressed by um, disturbing of habitat. The fragmentation of land by roads and developments break up the koala's habitat into several smaller segments. Any koalas brave enough to leave their isolated fragment are at risk of being run down by motor vehicles. And the alternative to stay isolated means having to reproduce within their own colony, creating an inbred population with low genetic diversity. Chlamydia can be treated with antibiotics, 
as well as prevented by contraception. These options, however, are not feasible considering the high number of wild koalas who have the disease. The Eucalyptus Woodland Free Air Carbon Dioxide Enrichment Facility is the only one of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. Carbon dioxide is carried through these pipes where it's released into the forest via the natural winds. Ben Moore, researcher at the Hawkesbury Institute for Environment, suggests that the Earth's increasing carbon dioxide levels and temperature is yet another threat to koalas. Climate change is causing the eucalypt forests to be at risk of losing nutritional value and digestibility. If this occurs, the koalas lose their food source. The combination of all these pressures is resulting in a decline in population numbers. But exactly how many koalas are out there? Deborah Tabat is CEO of the not-for-profit organisation, the Australian Koala Foundation. I have been ashamed of the number of koalas that I have seen die. We say anywhere between 50 and 100,000 koalas, and I personally think it's down around the 50 and 60,000. The federal government, however, proposes there are 200,000 koalas an estimate more than double of the Australian Koala Foundations. How can there be such a difference in the proposed koala population numbers? I'd say it's a matter of data quality. Uh, it's really only in the last couple of years that um, koala researchers and ecologists have been had the opportunity to, to start looking at koalas and assessing their population across at that national scale. So someone's data is, is um, outdated and probably maybe both are just estimates anyway. We've had 24 years or 25 years now of committed boards, staff, scientists, volunteers, thousands of people in the bush. So we have used all that information and created that number. And when I see government figures, I know that those people haven't been in the bush. They're sitting in a desk in Canberra somewhere uh, pontificating. Despite this confusion in number, everyone agrees that the koalas are dramatically declining. The question is, why are they worth saving? There's um, two species of moth that lay their eggs specifically in koala poop. Nothing else, that's the only place they lay their eggs. And those two species of moth and what they do out in the environment, nobody has researched. They could be really significant moths doing something incredibly valuable um, for the ecosystem. How long would it be if the koala went to extinction, could you sell another stuffed koala toy? And we sell about one billion dollars worth every year. Well we're going to miss out on such a lovely animal that we've got and, and it's just going to disappear and vanish and that's not right, not right at all. They're part of our heritage um, and they're uh, native to our country and we, we should look after them. Well, we're a native animal and I'd like to see them survive. Just a beautiful furry little coral. It seems like everyone thinks they're worth saving, but what's being done about it? You may as well give up on threatened species legislation if you're not willing to look after iconic species like the koala. That's why we went ahead with the listing. That's why the decisions were science-based. Environment Minister Tony Burke announced the koala to be listed as vulnerable to extinction in New South Wales, Queensland and the ACT under national environment law. Whilst the listing states koalas are protected, their habitat is not. The cutting down of trees in areas where they're listed as vulnerable does not necessarily require federal environmental approval. Every development is done on a piece by piece, site by site specific assessment. And providing you're not having a significant impact to that species, then there's no way um, council or any other authority can effectively stop that development from occurring. That's the problem with Threatened Species Act and Threatened Species Legislation, is that it allows, legally allows, the death by, death by a thousand cuts of, um, of habitat for any threatened species, providing that each death 
is just a non-significant cut. And that's exactly what's happened um, to anywhere of a development along the coast, is that's how it happens. It, you slowly get um, incremental development, and each incremental development doesn't have an impact. This is where um, uh, the legislation and Threatened Species Act uh, fails. Land is expensive. The koala has powerful enemies. The koala habitat is sitting on the top of coal mines, on the top of coal seam gas, on the top of roads, on the top of developments, and so they want it gone. Quarry is just one town which these tree dwelling marsupials call home. Additionally, it's home to more than 70,000 people, a classic example of where koalas and suburbia coincide. This particular site in Port Macquarie is one of the many examples where it seems development has taken over koala habitat. So there was a development application put in um, and it was approved a certain number of houses in that lot. They thought they were, would be a, a risk to you know, human um, safety, dead, dying in dangerous trees. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Mother and Joey been in it and um, they took it out because um, there's a development happening beside it and um, oh, but they might want to extend the development five years so they might as well do it while there's nothing in the way. And they know the tree because we, we really pounded them over it and we lost them. Unfortunately, uh, under the current legislation, you're allowed to remove a tree within uh, five metres of the property boundary. There was no way for council to stop it from happening because by definition we approved the house to be built near the five metres trees in the first place. So it's a really good example where, um, with all the good intentions, um, council or any other regulatory authority still often can't um, regulate to the, to the nth degree that it would like to on, on environmental issues like that. Fortunately, the policy in the area dictates that two trees must be planted for every tree cut down. The current legislation also, however, allows landholders to cut down trees without council permission if they are less than three metres in height. So theoretically, these replacement trees can also just be cut down or simply left to die, which is exactly what's happening. This year at the first ever National Koala Conference, we saw a variety of people from unique paths coming together to share their research and knowledge of koalas. One of the major aims of the conference was to discuss and hopefully take a step closer to resolving these development issues. The Greens MP and Environment spokeswoman Kate Fairman is well aware that development isn't going to stop. One of the things that the government can do is actually ensure that when they log state forests, they do it sustainably and they do it with biodiversity and the, and the creatures in that forest in mind. So what they're doing now is literally clear felling a lot of the forest and they'll leave a couple of trees, um, which are actually not the preferred um, feed tree of a koala. Uh, that means that koalas that were there can't come back. But sustainably logging a forest means that you can take some of the trees out, some of the trees that are good timber trees, but not trash, completely trash the whole forest and enable the species and the koalas to move to one patch of forest while you're logging that bit and then ensuring that they have trees to move back to. So this isn't happening at the moment. The Koala Foundation has formed a supporter campaign called the Koala Army. Its purpose is to get a Koala Protection Act passed. The Koala Protection Act is simple. No tree, no man. Don't cut the trees down. And if you, Mr Developer, own a piece of land and you want to cut those trees down, you can't until you prove your activities benign. If we're going to have a massive change in how we manage koalas, it's really going to have to be approach where um, you know the community at large pushes the pressure up to make that happen. They're iconic, they're known all over the world and, and they along with the kangaroo represent the, the animal fauna of this country. And how disgusting would it be if we lost them? How, how, how ashamed should Australia be if we lost these animals?
and they're just beautiful. They're just wonderful creatures. Can't we just have something here because they're just wonderful? <laughs> so, yeah. What we continue to fail to see is that without nature, there is no us. Chop and we've got to forest. work to repair yeah. some of the damage. We over harvest the seeds for money. And it's only when we do we that. live in a false economy. Um, and so we really be able to move forward properly. An ethical justification for biodiversity and conservation is that one species on Earth doesn't have the right to drive others to extinction. Koalas too have a right to exist. But if that isn't enough reason for you, look at their economic value, their aesthetic value, their cultural value, and their potential ecosystem services. By conserving habitat for the koala, we're not only protecting them, but the many native species in our eucalypt forests, both fauna and flora. While the many researchers, passionate conservationists and government authorities are doing what they can to protect the koala, the power is ultimately in our hands. You can help protect koala habitat by making this issue political. You can join the koala army at www.savethekoala.com. So perhaps once again, public cooperation can help these animals. It's all up to you.